The Hateful Eight may not be among the most beloved films in Quentin Tarantino's filmography, but it's still a terrifically crafted Western thriller, and a boldly left-field follow-up to the director's excellent Django Unchained. It's as richly dense as anything Tarantino has ever made, but between its almost three-hour runtime and the fact that it's probably less revisited than most of Tarantino's other movies, there's a good chance you missed many of its most fascinating details. I'm Ewan, this is War Culture, and here are 20 things you somehow missed in The Hateful Eight. Number 20. Django's Saddle We all know that Tarantino loves to reference his prior movies, implying something of a shared universe between them. And with that in mind, keep your eyes on the three bouncy corpses Samuel Jackson's major Marquis Warren has in his possession at the start of the movie. The saddle resting on top of them is none other than the very same distinctive saddle worn by Django, Jamie Foxx, in Tarantino's previous film, Django Unchained. How Django's saddle ended up in Warren's possession is anyone's guess, but honestly, the mystery is probably far more intriguing than any explanation Tarantino could possibly give. Number 19. John Ruth foreshadows losing his arm. A little later, Warren ends up punching outlaw Daisy Darmagu, Jennifer Jason Lee, in the face after she spits on his personal letter from Abraham Lincoln. This causes Daisy to fall out of the carriage, and because she's cuffed to bounty hunter John Ruth, played by Kurt Russell, he too is dragged out with her. As Ruth lays on the floor beside Domagu, though, he says something incredibly telling of his fate later in the movie, saying, Like to rip my goddamn arm off. Of course, near the end of the film, Domagu ends up freeing herself from Ruth's corpse by hacking his arm off in supremely grisly fashion, just as he hinted at some two and a half hours earlier. Number 18. Smithers stares at the audience. Here's a fun little nod to the audience that's incredibly easy to miss. When Ruth and Domagu first seek refuge from the blizzard in Minnie's haberdashery, General Sanford Smithers, played by Bruce Dern, is shown sitting down on the left-hand side of the frame. Keep your eyes fixed on him, though, as when Ruth and Domagu enter the establishment, he knowingly turns towards the audience and eyeballs them for a brief moment. Though he stops short of winking at viewers, it's as if Smithers is basically telling them, Hey, you. Buckle up for the ride, because stuff is about to go down. Given that the film is structured and presented very much like a stage play, and it was actually performed as a play before it got released in cinemas, it's quite fitting that Smithers appears to briefly break the bounds of the screen and make a connection with the viewer. Number 17. Oswaldo is related to Inglorious Bastards Archie Hickox. Tarantino has a knack for creating characters who are heavily implied to be the ancestors of other characters in his more contemporary set movies, and The Hateful Eight is no exception. Local hangman Oswaldo Mowbray, played by Tim Roth, is later revealed to actually be Pete Hickox, a member of the gang seeking to spring Daisy from custody. And given that names are never given out randomly by Tarantino, it's fair to assume that Hickox is an ancestor of Inglorious Bastards Lieutenant Archie Hickox, of course played by Michael Fassbender. Accepting that both characters are British, it tracks, and if there was somehow any doubt, Tim Roth himself stated around the movie's release that he was indeed the great-great-grandfather of a character from Tarantino's World War II epic. Number 16. The sign for Minnie's haberdashery is in Tarantino's handwriting. When we see the outside of Minnie's haberdashery, the handwriting for the scrawled sign just might look familiar to Tarantino fans, given that it's actually his very own. Tarantino has a tendency to scroll the title pages of his scripts by hand, and given that he has a highly distinctive handwriting style, it's clear that his own penmanship was used for the sign of Minnie's haberdashery. It's an easily missed piece of trivia if you've never perused a Tarantino script, but if you have, there's a good chance you'll spot this one basically instantly. Number 15. Senor Bob Smokes Red Apple Tarantino features a few fictional brands in a number of his movies, chief among them being Red Apple Cigarettes, which have in some form or another been spotted or mentioned in Pulp Fiction, Kill Bill Volume 1, Inglorious Bastards, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and yes, The Hateful Eight. Roughly an hour into the movie, it's mentioned that Minnie, played by Dana Gurrier, rolls her own cigarettes with red apple tobacco, and later Minnie name drops the brand herself. 
A more subtle invocation comes when we see Senor Bob, played by Damien Bashir, smoking, and Tarantino's narrator mentions that he, quote, enjoyed a manzana roja. That, of course, being Spanish for red apple. Number 14. The sly reference to a classic Kurt Russell movie. Quentin Tarantino is very clearly a fan of John Carpenter's seminal 1982 sci-fi masterpiece, The Thing, which just so happened to star one of the film's leads, Kurt Russell. And so, in one of the film's several nods to The Thing, Tarantino has Russell's John Ruth paraphrase a line spoken by Russell's protagonist from the movie, R.J. McCready. Early in The Hateful Eight, Ruth says that, quote, one of them fellas is not what he says he is, which is rather similar to a memorable line from the start of The Thing, where McCready Creedy says, somebody in this camp ain't what he appears to be. Given that paranoia is the central theme of both movies, it's certainly a fitting callback. Number 13. Daisy laughs at his Waldo's name and accent. Shortly after Ruth and Domagu enter Minnie's haberdashery, they're introduced by Oswaldo Mowbray, and this scene contains a subtle hint that things aren't quite what they seem. Immediately after Mowbray says his name aloud, we can see Daisy smiling with glee for a brief moment. Now, why would she do this? Because of course, he's working with her, and she's well aware that Mowbray isn't Mowbray, he's Pete Hickox. Daisy's evidently amused at him adopting a hammy posh accent and silly name for his cover, enough that she has almost given the game away with her first opening big grin. Number 12. It features music from The Thing and The Exorcist 2 The Heretic. Tarantino's love for John Carpenter as The Thing is best expressed for the fact that The Hateful Eight actually features three pieces of unused music from The Thing's musical score, as was composed by Western legend Ennio Morricone, who also earned his first Oscar win for his work on Tarantino's film. The tracks Eternity, Bestiality, and Despair were incorporated into The Hateful Eight due to Morricone's time constraints while assembling the movie's score. But that's not the only horror movie Tarantino paid all homage to. He also used Reagan's theme from Morricone's score for 1977's The Exorcist to the Heretic. If you want to know a not-so-fun, totally baffling fact while we're here, Morricone's The Thing score received a Razzie nom for worst original score. I completely understand why John Carpenter would want to be left in a locked room with the folks who did that, because this industry will never be able to atone for the crime of panning The Thing when it first released. Seriously. Number 11, the testicular throwback to Inglorious Bastards. Of the many things Tarantino has proven throughout his filmography, he's made it abundantly clear that he loves showing the male reproductive organs being absolutely destroyed to smithereens on screen. And in The Hateful Eight, he even offers up a self-referential homage to this fact, when Daisy's brother, Jody Domagu, played by Channing Tatum, shoots Major Warren in the testicles, but not before quipping, say adios to your huevos. Apart from this being just a really funny line, this is also a nod to a similar moment, of course, from Inglorious Bastards, where Sergeant Stiglitz quips, say auf Wiedersehen to your Nazi balls, before shooting Major Hellstrom square in the knackers in that movie's amazing bar scene. Django Unchained also features two instances of comical genital mutilation, though they sadly don't come with the same punchy one-liner. Number 10. Oswaldo talks to the floor. Shortly after Ruth and Daisy enter the haberdashery, Ruth goes to make some coffee, and Daisy loudly mentions to Oswaldo that the new Sheriff of Red Rock, Chris Mannix, the always brilliant Walton Goggins, is travelling with them. A moment later, Mowbray then loudly repeats this information, which, while a seemingly innocuous attempt to get clarification from Ruth, it's actually far more calculated. In retrospect, knowing that Mowbray is one of Daisy's collaborators and that Jodie is hiding underneath the floorboards, it's clear that this whole exchange allows Daisy, Oswaldo, and Jodie to get on the same page about who Ruth is traveling with. Number nine, the lack of bare feet. Even the most casual of Tarantino fans is well aware of the filmmaker's comical fascination with feet. With most of his prominent movies featuring close-ups of bare feet, typically those of women, at one point or another. 
Yeah, the Hateful Eight is a rarest of exceptions in Tarantino's filmography, given both that the movie transpires in a single location, and more importantly, it takes place during a freezing cold blizzard, where it would make no logical sense at all for anyone to be walking around without shoes on. Frostbite and chill blains be damned. While Tarantino probably could have snuck a bare foot in by having somebody take a shower or something, he evidently decided to let it go in this instance, probably aided in part by most of the ensemble being male. Number 8. The first death doesn't happen until 95 minutes. Death is a mere inevitability in a Tarantino film, and while Inglorious Bastards and Django Unchained didn't waste much time on the brutal bloodletting front, The Hateful Eight makes twitchy viewers wait their sweet time for it all to kick off. It's actually an incredible 95 minutes, almost the total runtime of Tarantino's directorial debut Reservoir Dogs, before anyone dies in the movie, and Major Warren opens fire on General Smithers, hitting him in the chest and killing him stone dead. And again, given the movie's beefy near three hour runtime and how expertly Tarantino builds suspense leading up to the first burst of violence, the wait is almost certainly worth it. Number seven, Kurt Russell's performance is a John Wade impression. Western fans might have noticed that Kurt Russell's performance as John Ruth basically feels like an impression of John Wayne in every fibre of its being, the vocalisations and body language in particular. But the nod to the Western legend actually goes further than that. When Daisy tells Oswaldo about Chris Mannix travelling with them, Ruth says, Ah, Sheriff of Red Rock, that'll be the day. That'll be the day is a line repeatedly spoken by Wayne's protagonist Ethan Edwards in the masterful 1956 Western The Searchers. And given Tarantino's clear fondness for that movie, even blatantly replicating its iconic doorway shot at the beginning of Inglorious Bastards, there's no way it's a coincidence. Also, actually, while we're here, let's throw a little bit more appreciation to Kurt Russell in the comments section below. Let me know your favourite performance of his there. I mean, mine personally is Jack Burton in Big Trouble in Little China, which is also my favourite movie ever. But yeah, let's get the Kurt love going down there this time, and also maybe cheekily give the video a like while you're at it. Number 6. Jennifer Jason Lee Breaks Character at this point, it's extremely well known that Kurt Russell accidentally destroyed an antique 1870s guitar while filming the scene where he snatches a guitar from Daisy and smashes it to pieces. What you might not have known, however, is that Jennifer Jason Lee's shocked reaction in the scene was totally genuine. Unlike Russell, she was well aware that he was handling the real antique guitar rather than a prop duplicate. And so when Daisy shouts, whoa, 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 while looking around the room, this was the actress effectively breaking character and looking at the film crew in shock. Thankfully, she didn't actively break character enough to blow the take, allowing Tarantino to still use it in the final film. As for the museum which lent the guitar in the first place, they no longer allow their instruments to be loaned out to movie sets, which, um, yeah. Number 5. Joe Gage quotes Inglorious Bastards. Midway through the movie, Ruth asks Michael Madsen's Joe Gage to hand over his gun. But before being persuaded to do so, Gage retorts, A bastard's work is never done. Her, John Ruth. That might sound like the sort of pulpy, hard-boiled dialogue you'd expect to hear in any Tarantino joint, but it's actually a little more than that. It's a nod to the tagline from Inglorious Bastards. The marketing materials for Tarantino's war film prominently displayed the text, A Bastard's Work Is Never Done, which is also a line featured in the scene that got cut from the final film. It appears that Tarantino liked the line enough to resurrect it in this movie. Number 4. The Secret Meaning of Silent Night Here's a brilliant, even ingeniously subtle piece of foreshadowing hidden in plain sight within the scene where Senor Bob plays Silent Night on the piano. If you know your music, you might be aware that the notes of the opening line, Silent Night, Holy Night, are G-A-G-E, as in Gage. As in Joe Gage. And given that this is the time at which the coffee is faithfully poisoned, it's basically Tarantino's brilliantly sly way of cluing in the most attentive, musically inclined viewers that they should be keeping an eye out for Joe Gage, who later admits to poisoning the coffee. Number 3. Mannix is always the first to follow Warren's orders. 
Once it's all said and done, we can appreciate that Chris Van Eyck was one of the movie's few somewhat good characters. But amid all the hand-wringing over his true allegiance, Tarantino actually made it pretty clear much earlier in the story. Following the whole poisoned coffee debacle, Major Warren tries to take charge of the situation by lining everyone up against the wall and making them follow his commands. Notably, it's Bannix who is always the first to follow Warren's instructions, whether doing what he says or replying to his questions. This tees up that he is, in fact, who he actually says he is. Number two, Joe Gage loses his cool in the background. Before we learn Joe Gage's true nature for ourselves, there is a sneaky hint a little while earlier, when a very pissed off Ruth hurls his bowl of stew in Daisy's face and she laughs at him. Look to the back right of the shot though, and you'll notice that Joe Gage stands to his feet immediately after Daisy gets splashed with the stew. On an initial viewing, this might be pawned off as mere curiosity on Gage's part, or even just mild concern. But given that it's later revealed that he's part of Jody's gang, it's clearly him assuming an offensive position in case Daisy's life is put in danger. And number one, Daisy's Angel Wings. At the end of the movie, Warren and Mannix hang Daisy in the rafters for her misdeeds, and for a moment, the snowshoes behind her protrude out perfectly from her shoulders, giving the impression that she's wearing angel wings. Now, Tarantino isn't so much saying that Daisy is an angel, because she's categorically anything but. Instead, this was apparently a total accident which Tarantino noticed during shooting, but he liked it enough that he decided to keep it in the final shot. Once again, sometimes great movie moments happen by pure happenstance, even when a director as exacting as Tarantino is involved.